So, as it turns out, <coughs> I picked the shortest psalm of the remaining repertoire to try to complete this class today. And I chose Psalm 1 because it's a mere six verses. And uh, as I was studying through it, I got through two or three verses. And uh, so what I think I'm going to do is extend this class one more week. Uh, the, the reason why I can do that, too, is that Pastor Dennis is on vacation. Um, and he, he won't mind because he won't be here <laughs> next week as well. If I didn't teach, no one would teach here next week. So might as well have one more class on Psalm 1. But today we'll be looking at Psalm 1. And uh, we are going to end at the beginning. Thank you for coming tonight. And so here, I want to start, before I forget, with the, uh, the attendance sheet. So just let us know you're here and just check off your name. And how, how are we doing tonight? How are you guys? I see smiles, I see nods. I see open eyes, which is a good thing. If you came, yeah, if you came in, it's like, oh, I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope you come in tired, because then you can get refreshed. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully, I don't put you to sleep. Uh, that, that would not be my intention tonight. Uh, I've heard people tell me before that my voice just naturally puts them to sleep, and I go, uh-oh, uh-oh, got to sharpen my voice or something. Um, all right, so I, we're going to be looking at Psalm 1 tonight, and I don't want to rush it, so we're going to be looking at the first three verses. We'll continue on with the last part of the third verse, and then till the end of the psalm, if you'd like to come next week. Uh, and so here... Let me open our time with a word of prayer, and then let's jump right in. Thank you, Father, that we are continually with you, and that you hold our right hand, that you guide us with your counsel, and afterward you will receive us to glory. Whom have we in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that we desire besides you. Our flesh and our heart may fail, but God is the strength of our hearts and our portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for us, it is good to be near God. I have made you, O Lord God, my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Thank you, Father, for this psalms class, for the joy it's been to walk through these psalms together and then to worship you with these melodies. And Lord, it is our prayer that they wouldn't just be songs, they wouldn't just be words either, but they would be the cry of our heart to draw near to God. As the psalmist says here, Lord, whom have we in heaven but you? And there is nothing that we desire on earth besides you. I don't know if there's one person in this entire planet that can actually pray that honestly. <laughs> and that yet, is, yet that's the truth, Lord. That's the truth. That's what we want. What we want is to have you be our everything, our satisfaction, our joy, our treasure, our refuge, our security, our God, our King, our Savior. And so, Lord, may your word draw us into you tonight so that this verse in Psalm 73, 25, would speak more of the progression of our heart. Lord, though we're not perfect in our love to you, we want to progress more in our love toward you, that you might be our whole satisfaction. That when Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you must hate, in terms of your love for me, hate mother, father, wife, children, your own life, or else you can't be your disciple. Father, I pray that 
we would have that kind of single-hearted devotion to the Lord, knowing that you are indeed the only satisfaction of our souls. We want to worship you tonight, Lord. Help us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Psalm 1. Let me read it, and then we're going to jump in. We are, once again, ending at the beginning. And it's good, because Psalm 1 is a fitting introduction to the entire 150 psalms. So, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Wow, right? All right, let's look at the overarching matters. This psalm does serve as a very fitting introduction to all of the psalms. Uh, Psalm 1 to 150, because it touches upon the major themes of the Psalms. If you notice, it's talking about final destinations here. You know, it's talking about God, it's talking about God's Word, and it's talking about the two responses that we can have to God's Word, either scoffing, either ignoring it, or obedience, or following, following after it, in fact, delighting in it. You notice that the Psalm portrays two kinds of people, two ways to live. Um, John Piper says it this way, the psalm presents the reader with two alternatives of ultimate seriousness. Piper has a way with his words. <laughs> two alternative of, alternatives of ultimate seriousness. Two categories of human beings. And right now, right away, I just want to draw an implication from that. The implication is this. Ultimately, the real spiritual distinction isn't between Republican or Democrat isn't between race, like black or white, or Chinese or Taiwanese. It's not social status, like upper class or lower class, or in church bodies like Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist. The real distinctions at the root, spiritually, are delineated in this psalm. In God's eyes, there's a difference between the righteous and the wicked. Those who follow after God's law, his moral law, and those who shun his moral law. And everybody, everyone you've ever met, and you sitting in this room, and me, we are all fitting into one or the other of that category, that category distinction. So God is emphatic about his distinction of righteousness and wickedness. This is God's heart being spoken of here. That's where he draws the line. Um, and it has to do with how you respond to his word. Can we turn real quick, hold our hands here, and turn real quick to Deuteronomy? chapter 30. Now, Deuteronomy is a foundational book of the Bible. It is the most quoted book by Jesus, if you didn't know. Uh, it's, it's an amazing book. Uh, Deuteronomy, it just, you know, literally translated as second law, but it's the second giving of the same law of God. Uh, it's when uh, Moses, it's basically a series of messages that Moses delivers to the people of Israel before he died so that he, they could remember the last things he said. But I want uh, to look at one of the very last things that he said here because of its relationship to Psalm 1. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and look at verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 30, look with me at verse 15. This is Moses setting it straight with the people of Israel. He says, See, I have set before you today life and and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today, that you shall surely perish. 
You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you, here's the distinction, life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days. Ultimately, you see, God's word leads us to God himself. He is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Do you see in God's mind that distinction? He just says, my word or not my word equals life or death for you. And uh, that is the point of Psalm 1. So I wanted to point that out. Let's turn back to Psalm 1. Notice, too, that in the psalm that there are two metaphors for the two kinds of people. The righteous are called a tree. We'll look at that a little bit today. The wicked are called chaff. You know what chaff is? It's like... What's that? Yes. Yeah, the, the, outer, the outer part of the wheat that goes away with the wind just blows it off. It's very light. It's very fleeting, right? Uh, versus a tree, which is rooted, which stands. Like, there are some trees that stand today that were there when Jesus' time was still there, when Jesus walked the earth. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing that trees can be like that, you know? They're just, they're stalwart, they're strong. So, two metaphors for two kinds of people. And, uh, and finally, there's two ultimate results from two ways to live. There's eternal recognition by God that says in verse 6, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And then there's eternal perishing or eternal just death for the wicked. It says, but the way of the wicked will perish. So there's two ultimate results. And the assumed backdrop of this is that there is such thing as absolute moral truth. There is an absolute moral law. Now, I, I want to say that up front because in our culture, in postmodern culture, that is lost. There is no such thing as black and white anymore in the sense of a truth and a non-truth. Everything is just gray now. People like to like, give their commentaries into a law. Like, I love, this, um, I love this little illustration by Kierkegaard. He wrote about how people were responding to God's word in his day. And he said it like this. It's like a king gives a decree, and the king gives a law, a decree out to the people for how they should obey him in his kingdom. But the people are philosophers. So what they do is they read the law and they go, what could that mean? What could the first law mean? You know, what are the, all the different nuances of that possible word? And, what, and at the end of the day, this law has 50 different interpretations, and no one has any idea how to obey it anymore because they've read into it all of these human thoughts. They've, they've really just turned this black and white decree into gray. And Kierkegaard was lamenting that and saying, this is what they're doing to God's word in my day. Now, they're doing that much worse in our day now. Uh, but in many cases, they don't even regard the Bible anymore. It's just kind of out the window. It's just whatever man thinks is, is right goes. So it's very important that we hold to this thing called absolute moral truth. That there is such thing as the righteous, there is such thing as the wicked in God's eyes. And, um, and this is a, an introduction then into the reality of that spiritual warfare. You know, that warfare that is between the righteous and the wicked, between God and Satan, between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. It's, it's a big backdrop for that. Now, an immediate application, even before we jump in, you have to choose. You're one or the other. Um, you either delight in God's law or you dismiss God's law. You, uh, your choice will determine the outcome of your whole life. Uh, we need this encouragement in, in God's law because of, of this world. Uh, we're surrounded by people who forget it. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. I know. It's here. I don't want it to fall over, so. All right. Are we following so far? All right. So I want to divide the psalm into two sides, just because it's two parts, two ways to live, and two destinations. The two sides are the blessed man and the wicked man. Um, and we'll look at each one 
I think we only have time to look at the blessed man today, but we'll see. Let's start at verse 1 and jump right in. It begins, blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. There are four implications that I want to draw out from this. Number one is joy. Number two is abundance. Number three is specificity. And then number four is God. All right, let me repeat that one more time. I'll go through it anyways, but we'll repeat that one more time. Joy is number one. Number two is abundance. Number three is specificity. And then number four is God. And let's look at each one now. Number one, joy. And I get that from the first word in the Hebrew, which is ashray. just means happy, joyful, um, blessed. Uh, it could be translated, happy is the man. As long as we understand that happy is not in the sense that we understand in English, because happy in English only means an emotion. I'm very happy right now. It's very circumstantial. This happiness is not based on the circumstances. This happiness is based on the reality of truth and God's word. And um, so it's a, it's a strong happiness. It's not just an emotion, although it does include the feeling. Uh, this is the way to happiness. Now, it's not fickle. It's not fleeting. It's lasting. And we've all been created to be happy for this desire to be happy like this. Uh, but our tendency is to seek happiness in things that will end with us not being happy. Uh, we seek happiness in things that weren't meant to make us happy. And so to meet our, our need for guidance, this psalm will point us to the way of true, lasting happiness. And um, you, might, you might be living according to God's word and at some point not feel an emotional happiness right? Like as a believer, it's not always going to be just, I'm, I'm on a high right now. I'm on the mountaintop, right? But there is a way of being able to go through even sorrows with the word of God and to have a joy that the circumstances don't shake. And that is the kind of idea that Ashray is trying to get across. Happy is that person. God will still see you as blessed even when the feelings don't seem to be there. So, no circumstance can take this joy. Ashray, happy. And uh, another thing is the second implication, abundance. Abundance. And I get that because the word ashray is in the plural. And it's so it's blessednesses or happinesses go to the man. Uh, Jesus, of course, would use this later to, uh, to formulate his Beatitudes. You know the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. He's using this kind of Old Testament language here of the Beatitude language. Blessed is. So, blessed are the poor in spirit. Here, in the plural, blessednesses. So, I, I want to bring out the implication that here it's talking about heaps and heaps of blessings. Not just like this singular, one-time blessing but this like continual wealth, unlimited blessing of joy. And it's not some uh, subdued or stingy blessing, but a generous and abundant one. God is not stingy or sparing with his blessings, and he's eager to give, to give these blessednesses, like unlimited for those who follow after him, for those who pursue him. So, it, this whole thing could be noted as an exclamation. Oh, the blessednesses of that man. Now I want to move on to the next implication, which is specificity. And specificity is here because the article is there in the Hebrew. It's blessednesses to the man. There's the. It's not a man, but it's the. There's a particular person in mind when it's speaking of here, a particular specific kind of person, a person who follows after God, who follows after his law. So there's, um, there's a re reservation here in the sense that this kind of generous blessing is reserved for a specific kind of person. Like the kind of blessing is reserved for those who don't choose to scoff at God's law, but choose to follow after his word, who delights in it, who loves it, uh, who loves him through it. And uh, this is an invitation then to be this kind of person because the danger is to be the kind of person who neglects his law. The danger is to be the kind of person who, who scoffs at it or who says, well, 
whatever that says, I'm going to live whatever way I want. So joy, abundance, specificity in terms of the specific kind of person who gets this blessing. And then finally, and this is the biggest one, I think, God. Do you realize that when it says blessed is the man, there's got to be someone doing the blessing, right? The implication is that there's someone behind it who gives the blessing. And that's why I want to bring out the implication right up front that it's God. That God is at the center of this psalm, even if he's not in the very first verse here. God is the one who gives this gift of blessing to us, and without God, there is no blessing with which we can speak of. Um, God, uh, you know, without God, there's no hope, there's no blessing, there's no meaning in life. Ecclesiastes 1-2 would be true, which is vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Nothing matters, nothing has meaning if God isn't behind it. God is the ground of meaning, and God is the ground of this kind of blessing. And so we're speaking of God here as the giver of this settled joy, this blessedness um, in the plural, uh, this satisfaction. It goes, from, it goes to us from God and from nowhere else. This joy and satisfaction cannot be found outside of him. Now, this uh, specific kind of person is now described by what he does and then what he, or he doesn't do, I mean, and then what he does. What, first, what he does not do and then what he does do. So what does he not do? He does not associate with the wicked. He does not associate with the wicked. Um, and it's uh, described in three, what, are, what I would like to call non-actions, <laughs> because it's not an action, it's just what he's not doing. And they're in synonymous parallelism. Remember last week we talked about Jewish poetry and how it, each line sometimes is in parallelism? Uh, and what happens in the parallelism is it strengthens an idea. Uh, it'll be synonymous. So one, one phrase will say the same thing as the next one, which will say the same thing as the next one. And what it's supposed to do is give you a very strong view from God of what he's trying to say three times through. That's what goes on in verse 1. He says, Who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the, the seat of scoffers. Those are three things that the righteous man must avoid. Now, I want to say as an aside right away, does that mean that we don't associate ever with non-believers? I'm not saying that at all. But I think there's a difference between uh, as associations. Like, there's a difference between saying, I'll have nothing to do with them, which would be impossible, because we have to navigate in this world. We have to navigate in this world where most of whom aren't believers. So if we, you know, it says in the New Testament somewhere, like, if I wanted you to be outside of the world, you'd have to leave the world. <laughs> because there's no way of, of not associating with, you know, sinners, especially since we ourselves are sinners. Uh, so it's not calling us to, like, completely separate, like, some cult group and just not associate with anybody. Um, but this is talking about kind of the association of close friendship, you know, kinship, like the closest friends that you have. Are they characterized like this, you know, evil counsel? Uh, walking in e an evil way that God does not like, that kind of thing. Um, so that, I wanted to get that across. Also, here's an aside. Many have commented on this verse, and they want to make it a progression of evil. And it's tempting, isn't it? Because it begins with walks. And then it goes to stand. Then it goes to sit. So some people like to read into this and be like, well, there's a progression of evil here. Evil is so insidious that it causes first, you first walk along it, then you're sitting in it, or, or you're standing on it, and then you're sitting in it. I don't, I would, I would like to say, although that's a great idea, and it preaches really well, <laughs> it's not the idea. Um, because the idea behind synonymous parallelism in poetry is to give you comprehensiveness, not progression. So the idea here is that this righteous person wants comprehensively to avoid ways of evil rather than like be the dangers of just progressing down this road um, let's look at each one and see see what it's saying here it begins who walks not in the counsel of the wicked to walk in this context is to heed the counsel of, wic of the wicked. So to heed their counsel, to listen to what they have to say. Uh, people who are devoid of God and believe that their evil counsel will make your life better. 
Um, I think maybe of these, this might come across as a trite illustration, but you mean the life of someone who heeds the advice and messages from television uh, or from uh, sitcoms or uh, television hosts rather than the Word of God. Like, I want to give an example. There's a there's like a, a show that's coming out soon called The New Normal. Have you heard of that? Yeah, I'm glad if you haven't heard of that. <laughs> but there's a new show called The New Normal. You know what the premise of the show is? Is that there is a single mother who needs money, and so what she's going to do is be the surrogate for a gay couple to have their child. And they want to call this The New Normal, you know? And this idea of, you know, mass media certainly reflects society more than influences it, but in a lot of ways it influences it as well. And my goodness, if that's the new normal, like, let's not heed the counsel of the wicked, right? Let's not let that be the new normal. And uh, that, that's what kind of gets me. And so the title of the show even kind of gives you that counsel it's trying to give you, right? This is the new normal, guys. Accept it. Uh, move on. And I'm like, no. Nah. You know, mass media does shape this public opinion, so let's not base our decisions on this, for instance. That's in just an example, but on this, let's base it as our source on God's word. Um, and here's another implication, is that do you think anyone listens to the counsel of the wicked and just goes, that's so wicked, I'm going to follow that. Like, no one does that, right? The point of wicked counsel being even acceptable is that it's got to sound good. So there's some insidiousness to that. There's like this idea that we could hear things based on man's wisdom and think it sounds so good. And then it doesn't measure up to God's word though. And if we're not educated in it, if we're not measuring it up to the standard of God's word, we, we, uh, we might fall into that counsel very easily. So who walks not in the counsel of the wicked? Secondly, nor stands in the way of sinners. I want to first explain the word way here. It's a common Jewish metaphor that doesn't just mean a, a literal road, right? It means a manner of life, a lifestyle, who doesn't live in the lifestyle of sinners. Um, so what's the implication here? For the person who follows God, who seeks after God, their life should look different, should look different than a sinner like, than someone who doesn't follow after the truth of God. I know we're all sinners, so I'm, I'm just using the terminology of the psalm, right? It says, who doesn't walk, walk in, a, uh, in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. Now, like, it, uh, it doesn't mean <laughs> perfection, right? It, does, it obviously does not mean perfection, because uh, then none of us would be able to, to follow after the psalm. We'd all be standing in the way of sinners. Um, but no, it's... It's reflecting a progression, rather. It's, pr it's reflecting a settled manner of life that isn't headed in continual sin. Uh, like, 1 John says it this way, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Now, that's not saying perfection. But that's saying, though, that it's progression of sanctification, right? That sin is being put away by the Holy Spirit in your heart as you follow after Christ. And, uh, and instead of living this lifestyle of continual falling back into the same sins and, and, the, and without even having a struggle in it, just accepting it. That's what it means to stand, you know, in the, in the way of sinners. That's what a righteous person is not to do. Now, nor sits, here it says, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Let's take a look at this very picturesque term. A scoffer or, or a mocker is someone who can never take anything seriously. Uh, it's, it's someone who turns everything, everything he hears into a joke that he can push back at you. You know? Um, he sneers at everything. He thinks he's above instruction. So that if you try to instruct this kind of person, he'll just be like, ah, it's just your perspective, and he'll spin it. Like, he's a very good spin doctor. Have you heard of spin doctors? Uh, people on television are very good spin doctors, too. They can spin, like, what a speech says or what someone's trying to say to serve their own purposes. And this is what a mocker is. That's what a scoffer does. I like how it says, sits in the seat of a scoffer. Because you know what the seat now here stands for? It's the judge's seat. 
You know, like a scoffer actually thinks he's the judge. He's sitting on the seat and he has the gavel and he can just tell you what he thinks, but you can't tell him what you think, you know? So that's a scoffer. Uh, he acts like God. He judges the way he thinks God should see things. And he sits in that seat. So um, in that condescension to everybody else and even God, he's the epitome of someone that we would call unteachable. And uh, this is what the psalm is not calling us to be, right? It's actually calling us to be the opposite. Be teachable. Please, don't be a scoffer. Don't just make a joke out of everything. Throw it back in people's faces. Don't, especially don't make a joke out of God's word. Because this is his response to the law of God. It's like, hmm, I'm above that. I don't believe that. I can judge God. Um, it takes really a humbling work of the Holy Spirit to make us live obediently underneath submitting to God's word. If you're even willing to, to submit yourself to God's word tonight, realize that's God's work in your heart, you know? Because naturally, let's admit it, we're all scoffers. In my pride, I'm a scoffer. Unless God were to work on my heart, I wouldn't obey him. I wouldn't follow him. I would try to take things into my own hands, and I wouldn't lay down my pride. So thank God for his work in the heart. And um, here, notice the plurals. Um, the wicked, sinners, and then scoffers, right? The plural. I want to bring out one more implication of this. They're in groups. They're not individuals. Uh, and what's the implication of that? Misery loves company. Basically it. Uh, when you're avoiding the influence of sinners, it's, uh, it's usually not just one, but it's a whole group of them. Uh, y beware, lest you find yourself amongst a group of them, because in, in groups, people are much stronger. Their influence is much stronger. And so, uh, you, know, they, they, you know, my mom always tells me to be careful who your friends are, right? Because you become your friends. And it's true, we, we are influenced like that, even subconsciously. So uh, just be careful about those influences on you. This, they're talking about groups of people here, not just one. And I want to make an, uh, an illustration of this, like um, cults are big on this, right? Cults, like, uh, they're, they're basing their, themselves off of something that's faulty, that's not the, the true meaning of God's word here. And so what ends up happening is um, they get stuck in a group, and there's this delusional worldview that they all embrace, and they actually think they're right. They really believe, right, that they are right. They believe that this is the truth because they, they're bolstering each other in their delusion. Um, the, uh, one of the strongest of these, I think, is this uh, religion called Scientology. Have you heard of that? I've d I did a little study on Scientology because I was like, interested in, in how a lot of celebrities are falling to this. And I was like, why? Right? So here's a little bit on Scientology. It was established in 1952 by a science fiction novelist called L. Ron Hubbard. That should have clued you in already. You can't buy into this. It's a science fiction novel. Okay, anyways. So... It teaches that we're all basically gods, okay? We're all basically gods, but we've forgotten our true nature. And the way we remember our true nature as divine is through going a, through a spiritual rehabilitation program that consists of a series of counseling sessions that they call auditing. Now, the way auditing works is that you sit with practitioners, and what they do in this group is they aim, and this is a quote, to consciously re-experience painful or traumatic events in your past in order to free yourself from limiting effects. Now, I find that very distasteful, just up front, to have them confront you with the most painful parts of your past all the time, just so like, they just like stab you over and over so that you can rise above it, apparently, right? Now, um, of course, you have to pay an increasing amount with each auditing session so that you can work your way up to advance in this religion. Now, the reason we know that this is the case is because people have reached the highest echelons of Scientology and found out at the very top that the whole thing was a sham. And they came out with these books uh, just telling about their experiences and what happened and, this, and how they were deluded with these groups and how they really believed it until they got to the top after paying hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's all emptiness. Um, that is really the power of a group, right? I mean, just the power of the influence of a person's vision that could be on someone. So, yeah, 
you know, it's, it's gotten lots of celebrities. John Travolta, Tom Cruise. Uh, you, you would think that people wouldn't buy into this, but that's the power of a cult. It's the power of a cult group. Uh, you, they'll make you believe in their group. And um, they support each other in their own sinfulness. So let's be very careful uh, about this, this thing here. They're wicked. They're sinners. They're scoffers. They, they're not delighting in God's law. Here is though what he does. This is what a righteous person does. This is verse 2. What, what he does is associate with God and his law. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. I love this because of the word delight. Do you realize that delight, it's very good. It captures the whole idea. Because delight isn't just mere assent to the truth, right? And also delight isn't just cold obedience. Like, okay, God, whatever. I have to obey because you're God, you know? Delight has the sense of warmth in your soul. That when you approach the word of God, there's an excited eagerness to draw near to God through his law, through his word. And uh, Piper says it this way, never reduce Christianity to a matter of demands and resolutions and willpower. It is a matter of what we love, what we delight in, what tastes good to us. When Jesus came into the world, humanity was split according to what they loved. And he uses this verse in John 3, 19. The light came into the world and men loved darkness rather than the light. You see, once again, there's the two ways. There was the response. And you can, uh, you can only fit in one of two of those categories. And, uh, and look at this word law. I like this too. Because this is not speaking of the law in capital as if it's uh, the five books of Moses. Because you know? it could refer to the law, which would be the five books of Moses. And it doesn't just refer to the Old Testament even as a whole. What it's referring to is instruction. You can really, like the word Torah here in the context means instruction, which means all revelation that we've received from God, which is why I now can apply it to the Bible. You know, it's scripture. Um, it's his delight is in the Bible in my translation. And uh, this law applies to the whole revelation of God. Now, here's an implication for us. Lots of people say that they believe in God, don't they? Like, lots of people even say, I love God. God is such an important part of my life. And I wonder sometimes what they mean by that. Like, what, what do you mean by that? Because what you mean by that is kind of what the content is. Anyone can say they love God. I can say I love God. What, what is the evidence of that? What, what does it mean to love God? And I like how this, this psalm sets it for us. It, it's a response to his word. That is a love for God. It's a, it's a delight in his word. It's a devotion, in this case, uh, I want to apply it to the Bible, not just fuzzy feelings or some pious words about God, but it's an actual response to his actual revelation to us. It's a love for his word. It's a happy obedience to God's word, which, which evidences a true love for God. Uh, it's amazing, really, how people can say they love God and not have any idea what that means. Like, uh, so-called churches can say they love God and not even care about the Bible anymore, right? Um, there's a popular idea right now that loving God is simply this thing, social justice. You know, loving God is, is just doing good things for people. You know, like, like building houses and uh, giving them clean water and, uh, you know, fighting uh, human trafficking and the like. And all of that is really good. Like, all of that is very good and can also flow from a love for God's word. But it can also all be there without God's word as well, right? Like the, the secular world, I mean, we have the, the UN trying to do all that stuff too. And, uh, and they're not the church. They, they, they don't have God's truth guiding them, right? So there's the sense where we can do all those good things for people but be missing love for God. Love for God might be missing from that. And the love for God would be found in devotion to his word. We do all these things. We want to go out there. Uh, social justice issues are great. Uh, build houses. Be there for orphans. Visit the widows. Like all these things. But remember where our driving force is. It's, it's a love for God and his word. It's not just because we're good people. You know? it's, uh, let's not do things instead of delighting in God's word. Let's do things through loving God's word. And we stay true to his word and delight in it. That's truly loving God. 
C.S. Lewis notes this contrast between the righteous and the wicked in the psalm. He, he really helps us to see the beauty of God's law when he says this quote, the law's beauty, sweetness, or preciousness arose from the contrast of the surrounding paganism. We may soon find occasion to recover it because Christians increasingly live in a spiritual island. Well, uh, that was true in C.S. Lewis's day that, you know, secularism was taking over, uh, biblical literacy was going down, and uh, this is more than ever now. Uh, you know, very few people hear about the Bible or know anything about the Bible anymore. Remember last Sunday, Pastor Dennis gave a, a sermon on the Good Samaritan, right? And, uh, and he mentioned that when you, even just 50 years ago, you could say the Good Samaritan and even people walking along the streets who weren't Christians understood what that story was. Nowadays, you say Good Samaritan, they're like, what's a Samaritan, you know? And, and also, uh, this is what really irks me too, is what is good? I'm like, devoid of God, we don't even have any definition of good. It's true. It's true. So let's, uh, let's find God's word very sweet to us because this truth gets us through this morass of meaninglessness that we're trying to walk through in this day. Uh, it says here, not, here's the extent to which we are devoted to God's law. It's his delight is in the law of the Lord, and this is how he shows it. On his law, he meditates day and night. On his law, he meditates day and night. And uh, it's not you know, read in the morning and forget the rest of the day kind of treatment of God's word, right? This is a continual meditation. The word here in Hebrew is an onomatopoeia. You know what onomatopoeia is? It's like a sound that, uh, it's a word that sounds like a sound that it's supposed to imitate. It's the word haga. Like when people are meditating or when, when, a, when a, an animal is snorting continually, it'd be like haga, 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 haga. The idea is a continual muttering, a continual speaking to oneself. Uh, and it comes from that animal world. So when you speak to yourself in these words, make sure it's God's words, basically. It's the kind of person who takes a verse and you're speaking it to yourself as you live throughout the day. You're actually telling it to yourself. So that's the, what it meditation means. And now, I like this too because we all know how to meditate. And the reason I know that is because we all know how to worry Worrying is meditating on something that isn't God's word. I worry, I get fixated on my worry, right? And then it just spins into my head, into this morass, this void of darkness. And the way I catch it is in the morning, when I'm spinning into that morass of darkness, I go, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemy exult over me. I'm just spinning speak in psalms right i want to pray i want to have god's word counter that that's the way we fight you know it's called the sword of the spirit for a reason it's the only offensive weapon in our arsenal right so we take it and we actually slash at these lies that we believe and so this these words that's what to meditate you know to meditate to speak it to yourself to make sure you're just oh okay now two steps two steps to meditation number one read it number two think about it. Um, and so if you're tempted to worry, replace that worry with God's word. At least try. Now, I know this is not, okay, this is not an easy fix. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to present to you any easy fix. This is not an easy answer. I'm, I'm not saying this is easy at all. In fact, in my own life, I struggle like crazy. I fight to have God's word cl you know, fill my mind rather than worries, right? I fight. And may you fight alongside me, you know? May, may we all fight to meditate on God's word. We're in a war, and this is going on. So first of all, read God's word, or hear it. Read or hear it, right? You can't meditate on what you don't know. So let's know it. Let's get in it. Um, in ancient times, people didn't have a Bible, so we're very privileged, right? People would go to synagogue, they would hear it taught, and then they would just like, they would pay rapt attention to it because they know that when they go home, they don't have the, the word with them. So they would grab onto it and they would speak it to one another as they're going home. And then when they're, they're home and they go to bed, they're just meditating on it in the night. They're just thinking about God's word, thinking about what was said that came from God. Like that should be our, our whole meditation process. Fill your mind with scripture. Secondly, think about God's word. I've heard, now this, this is the whole thing about worrying. <laughs> Instead of worrying, when you know you're worrying, you're like, well, 
I know how to meditate now because I'm meditating on this thing I'm worrying about. Let's meditate on God's word. Let's find something to meet this and let's think about that. Uh, I love this illustration. Now, George Mueller, do you know who George Mueller is? One of my favorite heroes in, in church history because George Mueller was a starter of orphanages in England. And uh, he lived from 1805 to 1898. He's famous for establishing hundreds of orphanages. Unfortunately, not one is left because they went all socialist and over there. And there's, there's not very many orphanages left. But um, he, he was known for relying on God for help in remarkable ways. And God always came through for him. Now, he speaks something really awesome about meditation. So it's a long quote, but bear with me because I think it's helpful to us. He says this. This is George Mueller speaking. Every morning, the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord, how much I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state with the Lord and how my inner man may be nourished. For I might seek to set the truth before the unconverted. I might seek to benefit believers. I might seek to relieve the distressed. I might seek in other ways to behave myself as it becomes a child of God in this world, and yet not being happy in the Lord and not being nourished and strengthened in my inner man day by day, all of this might be not attended to in a right spirit. Now, I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the Word of God and to meditation on it, and that thus my heart might be comforted, encouraged, warned, reproved, instructed, and thus, whilst meditating, my heart might be brought into experimental communion with the Lord. I began, therefore, to meditate on the New Testament from the beginning, early in the morning. The first thing I did after having asked a few words of the Lord's blessing upon his precious word, was to begin to meditate on the word of God, searching, as it were, into every verse, not, or to get blessing out of it, not for the sake of public ministry, not for the sake of preaching on what I had meditated upon, but for the sake of obtaining food for my own soul. I love that because it's convicting to me. The moment I read a truth, I like... I'm going to teach this. <laughs> like, I've got to turn this into a sermon. And I do. I'll, very often I do. But to read God's word for yourself, to feed your soul, right? To have you be happy in the Lord is more important than to, to have a utilitarian view of the word of, I'm just going to use this to bless, or I'm going to use this just to do God's will today. You know, like, no, I, let's go to the word because we need God. Go to the word because I need you, O oh Lord. I need to worship you. And I love this because I didn't read the whole quote anyways. He goes on to say that he used to not begin with scripture. He used to begin with prayer and how distracting that was because he would find that he would go about an hour before he started really praying. But when he went to the word of God, he would find that those verses became his prayers. Those verses guided him into prayer. And so this meditation on the word of God is everything. It's so important in terms of how to get our minds in that geared moment of worship. We don't have to scrounge up these prayerful you know, notions. Let's go to the Word. The Word will teach us right. The Word will lead us to the throne of God. That was his secret in keeping his heart happy before the Lord. Meditation on Scripture. And it's, it very well could be ours as well. Uh, you know, I've been meditating on this verse today. Um, and uh, that's why I prayed through it uh, at the beginning. Psalm 73, 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth there is nothing that I desire besides you. That psalm, uh, that verse is very challenging to me as I meditate upon it because I just wonder who in the world can honestly pray the second part of that psalm. On earth there's nothing I desire besides you? My goodness, that's quite an ideal. <laughs> and... Um, so there's, there's just a great benefit in, in meditating on that and then asking God, please, you do this work of moving my heart in the direction of your truth. Please, God, please help me. Now, uh, I want to look at one more thing before we end for tonight. And that is the words day and night. 
Now, the implication is this, because we might think that going to God's word is a quiet time. But this, uh, this verse is making that not what it means, right? Because if you're going to meditate on God's word day and night, you can't just relegate that to a quiet time or else your quiet time is all day and all night. Like, if we're going to apply this verse, if we're going to obey it, this can't just be setting apart time, right, for personal devotions, although that is very important. This is about walking in your daily life, carrying God's word with you in your mind. So day and night, having your mind filled with God's word and then carrying it with you through the day as you work, as you play, as you, um, you know, deal with the kids. I don't know, as you do whatever you're doing uh, to carry God's word with you through that so that he would make your path straight. Like in Proverbs 3, 6, I think that's what it means when it says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And to acknowledge him, I think explicitly means carry his word with you in all your ways so that he would make the path straight. Now, meditation is, you know, thinking about God's word no matter where you are, no matter what time of day, no matter what you're doing. It's simply having God's word running around in your mind every moment, every chance you get. And, uh, and that's, that's a beautiful and a, a convicting call for us tonight to really, you know, replace your worry with God's word. To have God's word meet you in your time of need so that you're, it's filling your mind and not the things of this world. Well, praise God for his word. That's, what it, that's his function. That's what it does for us. Um, that's, that's what it's, uh, it's meant to do. It's leading us to the throne of God, leading us to God himself. And now we got through two verses. Uh, I want to... I want to sing it with us tonight. I want to teach us uh, a little bit of a tune that I, I wrote this psalm to. It'll sound a little folky. It's a little different than the other psalms I think I've written, but it's very happy. Let's give this a try here. I'm sorry for those of you who are watching on YouTube. I don't think this is going to turn out too well, sound-wise. But come and join us. All right, let's see here. Let's see if I see if I get a good. Mm. Oh, by the way, I wrote this in Kentucky, which is why it sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, how about I sing the first line and then repeat it after me. So it goes, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Can we sing that together? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. The second line is like it. It says, Nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Ah, you're catching on already. Can we sing the first two lines together? One, two, three, four. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners nor sits in the seat of scoffers and here's the next line but his delight is in the law of the lord can we sing that together but his delight is in the law of the lord and on his law and on his law he meditates day and night but his delight but his delight is in the law of the lord and on his law he meditates day and night verse one blessed is the man who walks not in 
the counsel of the wicked. Nor stands, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. Beautiful. Okay. Now here's the chorus. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Can you sing that with me? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. The next part is kind of like it. He is like a tree planted by streams of water and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. Can we sing the chorus together? He is like a tree. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. He is like a tree planted by streams of water and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Very good. So let's sing the second verse here. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous he is like a tree he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season he is like a tree planted by streams of water and its leaf does not wither in all that he does he prospers and here's the last line it's a bridge for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Hmm? There's that psalm. Would you stand with me and let's sing the whole psalm together. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted 
by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. He is like a tree planted by streams of water and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. He is like a tree planted by streams of water and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Here's the bridge. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. He is like a tree. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. He is like a tree planted by streams of water and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Can we end on, for the Lord knows? For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Amen. Thanks for joining us tonight. Can I close in prayer for us? Father, thank you for the beauty of your word. Thank you for the preciousness of it. Thank you for the delight that we have because of Jesus Christ through it. And Lord, I pray that we would be those that would meditate on your word day and night. I pray that we would be those who delight in your law. I pray that we would be those who stand for your truth and who seek your blessing, O oh God. And uh, thank you for this Psalms class. Um, thank you for the faithful that have come here hungry for you. We crave you, O oh Lord. We are starving for you. And so give us more of you. Help us to know you more. Help us to walk in your ways. May you be number one. For we know all these things uh, we're not to worry about because when we have as first your kingdom, your righteousness, all these things will be added to us. Lord, give us that rest in you this week. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone.